Rich Davini, thanks so much for being with me on the show. Thanks for having me. It's, it's nice pleasure. to, yeah, it's nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Well, I'm excited to do a deep dive into your background because you've done some cool shit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no doubt, no doubt. Um, you are a like if you're a Navy SEAL, aren't you? If you're if you're one once, aren't you always a Navy SEAL? Well, there's a there's those who who subscribe to that, I, and I don't. It's not that I don't subscribe to that. I, I tend to want to give honor and credit to those hmm. folks doing the job currently and i did the job and um the guys who are doing the job are still in the fight and doing the hard work so i'm happy to say i was former navy seal i did my part and i have much respect and honor and gratitude to those who continue the fight so well i have much respect and gratitude and and hold much honor for you my friend because that is i mean Look, in my brain, once a Navy SEAL, always a Navy SEAL. That you're you've you've already achieved something that very few humans are capable of achieving, and you've done it for the greater good, essentially, right? I mean, you're a, you're a, a man of service, and uh, and so I just want to celebrate you and thank you for you know for everything that you've put into um to yeah to achieving that. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate I appreciate the appreciation from those. I mean, we've you know I think. The appreciation for the military nowadays is unprecedented, and we've seen how history has taught us some lessons about not appreciating the military is a is generally a bad thing. So, I think military service members holistically feel very, very appreciated, and I think that's a it's 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 felt good the whole time, and it continues to feel good. I'm, I and I I'm I'm really happy that that's been a trend. So I appreciate all the support um, for me and for everybody who's served and continues to serve so yeah you you and all the other servicemen and women out there have my support wholeheartedly um so what i have to what i guess i i must ask first is for a little bit of a sense of what that training was like because to me it's the coolest thing ever but i'm not one of these guys i have to admit that like follows you know all that closely like what seal training is like yeah. you know my, my brain was in other realms growing up you know i was more into like music and stuff so i kind of missed all that but um but yeah, I mean, it, like, what's it like? So you guys are like kind of the the toughest of the tough. Is that <laughs> is that kind of that's like at least mythologically what I believe to be true? But is it is that actually true? Well, I, there are some tough people out there, and I would <laughs> say SEAL training certainly selects and assesses for those who are physically and mentally tough when it comes to that type of training. Um, you have to because again, what you're trying to do is not figure out whether or not someone um, has the know-how to do the job it's more if someone can do the job because the job in any any military job but certainly special operations is wrought with uncertainty challenge problem solving you're going to find yourself in situations that you probably have not anticipated or have tried to anticipate but things go the wrong way um and so the question becomes do you have what it takes to to get through it um because in combat when the when the bullets start flying or or anything uncertain starts to happen, you need to be able to think through it. And I think that this, you know, all military training, but certainly a SEAL training was designed on that premise. And so, um, and and really the kind of the impetus of the book, which I know we'll talk about more, what I loved about BUD, so basic underwater demolition SEAL training is, is, is BUDS for short. That's what, that's what, if someone wants to be a SEAL, they go through that course. They have to join the Navy first, of course. And they go through BUDS. BUDS, which is a six month course and it's down in San Diego and uh, three phases and hell week is one of the infamous, you hmm. know, weeks where you go a week without sleeping for, you know, you only sleep for about three hours and you're constantly, you know, doing heinous physical activity, running around with boats on your heads, log PT, getting frozen in the surf zone, things like that. And that's when you get your most attrition, right? So, so typical attrition rates are somewhere around 85 to 90 percent so you'll start with a class in my buds class back in in mid 90s we started with 165 or so graduated 38 and that's that's normal numbers um but i think for me uh, so certainly very tough for me what i loved about the training was the purity of it um because of the way it's designed you it doesn't matter where you're from doesn't matter what your background is doesn't matter if you were a an all-star athlete, an alma mater, if you were from, you know, New York, Kansas, or whatever, uh, that course is going to take you down to zero mm. and see if you have what it takes to get through. And and there is there, I, I think there are so few environments or processes in in this world that one can go through that are that pure. That when you get there, it's just it's all on you. And I think that was, and to this day remains one of my um one of the things I like about that the most uh, is the purity of it, because um, you, you're left with this 
small group of guys who you know you trust can pretty much make it through anything. So you develop a lot of trust in each other, trust in yourself. You learn things about yourself, and and um, subsequently that that comes in handy, especially you know when you have a war to fight. Oh my God, it's like a fraternity. Yeah, but like the most the the probably you know I mean you literally do go through hell. You go through hell week. Right. It's insane. And where were you? Where were you stationed? So I uh, so I started so trainings in San Diego. My first duty station was in Hawaii, hmm. and I uh, I was with I was working with the our, our kind of mini submarines called the SDVs, and then from there went to the East Coast to Virginia Beach, where the East Coast SEALs are, and it was there basically my whole almost pretty much my whole career. So and I'm an East Coaster anyway. I grew up in New England, so East Coast was kind of home for me. So. Wow. And is it true that there are only about like 2,500 like on duty? Um, active duty seals at any given time. Yeah, I'd have to look at the numbers. They, they, the 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 war caused us to have to beef up the numbers a little bit. Um, mm. So I would guess that so, there's somewhere between thirty five hundred and four thousand active duty at any one time. So it was what I guess. But you know, naval special warfare is seals. It's special warfare combatant crewmen, which are boat guys. It's I mean, it's a it's also a, a just a mushroom of support, whether it be combat support, intelligence. Um, logistics i mean so so the special operators the seals whether you're seal green beret or whatever get a lot of the the cool guy credit but none of us could ever do what we did without the support of everyone around us our intel folks our support folks our supply folks our logistics folks i mean it is it is truly a team a community and so so naval special warfare as an organization is is fairly large because you just it takes a lot of support to do that type of job. I'm sure that makes a lot of sense. So you wrote you have this new book coming out, The Attributes, which I'm super excited for. I think it's actually a brilliant book. I've 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 skimmed it already and I'm excited to do a uh, to do a deep dive. How did you come to write this book? Like um when did you when did you decide to pivot your career and and focus full time on um you know, public speaking and 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 writing? Well, that's a great question. The, the The pivot didn't come till I was retired. <laughs> you know, that's when you know I began to start thinking about what do, what do, what do I want to do. So I'd always been interested in writing. The idea for the book came well before I retired. I was it was about midway through my career, and I was in charge of training, assessment, and selection for one of our more specialized SEAL commands. And in this particular command, what what, what would happen was we'd actually take very experienced SEALs. They'd apply to come to our command. And then we would run them through our own selection course, about nine month selection course, to see if they, you know, had what it took to be at that specific command. And um, what what was what we had was it's typically about a, still about a fifty percent attrition rate. And so we we were in a position when I took over where we weren't able to effectively explain why guys were making it and why guys weren't making it because again we were talking about guys who had stellar um, records and and achievements and performance that were coming very highly recommended. And uh, and and they were getting to our program. Some of them weren't, weren't making it through. And to say something like, "Well, you didn't have what it took. You don't. You, you didn't. It, you didn't. You didn't cut it." Was really. Not, it was a very demoralizing thing to tell someone to that person and to us because it didn't describe to us effectively what was going on. You know, if we don't, if we don't, can't describe what we're doing, it, it's not helpful for us either. So, so I was tasked with by my commanding officer at the time. Um, can you can you look at what we're doing and better articulate it? And so that's really when I began to look back at our roots. And this is when we kind of went back to regular SEAL training. I mean, the SEALs were formed back in the 40s with World War II, and they were formed as the underwater demolition teams. You know, when they were planning, when they knew they had to invade Europe uh, with a with a massive amphibious invasion, they recognized, based on lessons from World War One, that they needed to get people, men who could swim ashore and reconnoiter and look for obstacles so the ships that the ships could come in, the landing craft could come in. And so they said, well, we need guys who can swim in, plant explosives on these obstacles, clear paths so these Marines can land. So Draper Kaufman was tasked with uh, creating this unit, and he had previously run a, um, created an explosives ordnance disposal school. And so he he had in his I guess, Rolodex uh, of, of contacts and connections, a whole host of guys who had the appropriate skills to do the job. They could swim. They could all swim. They could all put explosives on, on obstacles. They could all, you know, sneak across beaches and things like that. What he recognized, though, is that in that environment, he needed men who uh, could do the job. So how to do the job and could do the job are two different things, right? How to implied skills. I have mm-hmm. the skills to do it. Could, can you do it when things are really rough? 
So in, in what I kind of nicknamed unconscious genius, he said, you know, I'm going to start the, tr the whole training program with a week of just intense training where I only let the candidates sleep for maybe an hour or two. I, uh, we put them through physical tests, you know, some mental tests, but basically take them to exhaustion and beyond. And he said, I'm not going to evaluate anybody. I'm not going to run any tests. I'm not going to grade anybody. The only thing that will um, uh, qualify someone to stay or leave is their own, their own decision. So is someone going to quit or someone to stay? Well, well, most guys quit. About 90% quit. Hmm. And, but he knew that at that point, he had the 10% that would be able to effectively operate. So that week, well, you know, later morphed into what is known as Hell Week today. You know, Bud says Hell Week is the fifth week, not the, not the first. But, you know, ultimately what he was looking for is not the skills, but the attributes. The mm. attributes are things like, so just a level of the playing field. What I, what I really was able to, with my team, deconstruct is that skills and attributes are different. Skills are not inherent to our nature. So we don't, we're not born with the ability to ride a bike, throw a ball, or shoot a gun in the military case, right? We have to, we have to learn those things. We have to be taught them. You can sit down and learn a skill, right? You can, you can actually learn something on the periphery. If you and I sit down at a computer for six months for a job, we're going to learn how to type right? That's a skill. They dictate our behavior, right? So they tell us what to do in certain situations. So here's how to drive a bike or drive a car. Here's how to ride a bike, so on. And then because uh, they dictate behavior, they're very easy to assess, measure, and test. You can see how well someone does those things, which is why that most, you know, most hiring processes, selection processes get seduced by skills first, right? Best sales guy, best HR rep, uh, best graphics designer. Those are all skills, top grades, right? What skills don't tell us is how people are going to operate in uncertainty and challenge. Because in uncertainty and challenge, um, the the uh, the the skills that dictate behavior don't apply. You can't you can't necessarily apply a skill to an unknown situation. This is where attributes come in. Attributes are inherent to our nature. Mm. We're actually born with levels of perseverance, adaptability, resilience, situational awareness. Right? You can see actually those you can see those things in small children, um, and so. Certainly, they develop over time, but you can see them in, you know, as young as small children. They inform our behavior rather than dictate it, right? So, um, so your and my level of perseverance, adaptability, and resilience, for example, will inform the way we learn how to ride a bike when we fall off that bike 10 times or so, right? But because they're hidden, they're very difficult to assess, measure, and test. When you see them the most viscerally is during times of challenge, stress, and uncertainty, because that's when they come to the fore. I can't apply a known skill, so... My attributes, right? So I'm going to lean on my patient's adaptability. So a great example for all of us is 2020, yeah. right? I mean, COVID especially threw us almost overnight into this deep level, deep environment of uncertainty. Very few of us had the skills with which we could apply right away. We all had to basically say, okay, what the hell is going on and how am I going to deal with it? We were leaning on things like, uh, like attributes, adaptability, resilience, all this stuff, all the things I talk about in the book. And so, so they, so, so that type of situation began to bring those to the fore. This is exactly why I was able to kind of study these so easily in SEAL training, running what I was, because, because the SEAL training by its very nature is to put people in stress, challenge, and uncertainty. We're looking for attributes. So I began to do this when I was running this training. It stuck in my mind. And then 10 years, 10 plus years later, when I retired, I began to do public speaking around leadership and things like that. I'd always been really interested in human performance. So why do people and how do people behave the way they behave? And really, quite honestly, how do uh, people just excel? And see, you know, I was always, I grew up in Connecticut. I was an average kid. I was an average student. I was an average athlete. I mean, I didn't have any real trauma or, or you know, real distinctive stories that could add to my narrative as, oh, this is why he became a Navy SEAL. There's nothing like that. I was just a normal kid. Yet, and, and then when I went through SEAL training, I made it through and I found myself staring at people who, man, I'm, I'm surrounded by superheroes here. Mm. How did I get here, right? What was interesting to me is most of the guys thought that way. <laughs> They'd look around and say, I'm surrounded by superheroes. But they, we all felt distinguished. Uh, we all felt pretty average. Like we're not, there's nothing special about us is how we all felt. Most SEALs will say that. You know, there's nothing really special. We just figured out a way to, capitalize on our strengths. And hmm. so this is when I began to really think about attributes. When I got out of the military and I was interested in human performance, I kept on, I started talking about high performing teams. I kept on getting asked, hey, Rich, we just put together this dream team. Put together, you got the top sales guy, the top graphics designer, top whatever, right? They were awesome until things went sideways <laughs> and the team just went, they went, went toxic. They fell apart. And they said, what, you know, 
why does that happen? I said, because you were looking at the wrong things. You were, you were putting together your team based on skills when you really needed to put your team together based on attributes because attributes will tell us how we perform, um, both in normal times in a hidden way, but certainly when things go south. And so what I did was I, for the book, I basically took the attributes that I had explored in the SEAL teams, tried to ubiquitize them, right? Because some of them don't apply um, in normal life like they do in the SEAL teams, um, and then put them in the categories. You know, what are the grit attributes? What are the mental acuity attributes? What are the drive attributes? What are the ones that make up great leadership? And what are the ones that make up great team ability? And came up with 25. And again, that's not an exhaustive list. There are a lot more than 25. But there are more than 25? Well, I talk about 25, but there are more than 25 attributes that exist. So It's, uh, it's fascinating. Yeah. And I love how you've <laughs> categorized them by five sort of umbrella categories. You've got attributes that are indicative of grit, mm -hmm. attributes that are indicative of mental acuity, the drive that one has. I love that. But one thing that I want that I just want to clarify. Um, so, so attributes, you said skills you learn, you can learn over time. You have the yeah. capacity to develop <laughs> and improve upon, upon your skill set. Uh, attributes you're to a certain degree you're born with. Are you, are you suggesting that they're immutable, that we, that we, that we can't develop attributes that we aren't born with, that we can't, um, improve upon the attributes that that we might already exhibit right i am absolutely not suggesting that we can actually great improve. that's that's, that, <laughs> can, that's good news yeah we can totally improve the difference is you can't do it the same way you can learn a skill uh an attribute has to be developed it has to be first first of all you have to be self-motivated it has to be self-directed and um and you also have to, to, to kind of decide to consciously put yourself into into environments of discomfort so that you may test and develop that attribute. So if you are, for example, an inherently impatient person and you want to develop your patience, well, I can't sit down and teach you a class on how to be patient. It's not going to work. You have to decide, I want to learn my patience. I want to develop my patience. Then you have to put yourself into environments that test your patience, mm. right? Uh, say, so it goes with any attribute. If you want to be more adaptable, if you want to be more resilient, if you want to be more disciplined, you know, whatever it is, uh, you have to, you have to do it yourself, but they can be developed. Um, yeah, they are not immutable, and uh, and but it you, it's your decision. You, there are some attributes that you may not need to, or want to develop, depending on your role in life, depending on what you're doing. I mean, I have leadership attributes. Not everybody is a, a really a leader per se. I mean, we all we all you know have relationships, but maybe you're maybe you're a comedian, right? That's not really. It's kind of a self directed profession, right? So you don't need to be a leader per se, or or a great teammate. So there's some of those that you might not need to develop. It's really up to the to the individual. I love that. So how did you then adapt uh, these attributes that you identified um, in your, you know, among your team members and then uh, sort of extrapolate out so that people from all different professions could could basically benefit from them? Well, I, I first thing I did was, you know, I came, when we did it for the team, we came up with 36. So the first thing I did was I looked at that list and said, OK, based on what I know now, which ones are more skilly <laughs> than yeah. they are? Attributes. So we took. I, I took out those, uh, and then I then I looked at. There were some that were distinctly um, designed for. I would say, you know, good for SEAL team uh, uh, um, action, right? I mean, so so each team depending was, on, was bloodlust one of the ones that <laughs> didn't not, make the cut. I, I didn't explore that one. <laughs> but honestly, if someone had bloodlust, I would probably deselect them because <laughs> there needs to be. Uh, that's that's a little bit too far. You need to, you know, so the the warrior profession you know, is something that I think, well, most of us think has to be taken very seriously. When you are really endowed with the, in, in, in to put it bluntly, permission to take life, that is a responsibility that's very weighty, you know, and, and if you don't, if you don't consider that, and if you don't have the right mentality around that, you have problems. Some of those problems we've seen played out, you know, because, because some of it becomes public and you're like, yeah, that's a problem, right? When you're in war, it, it, you have to really be um, cognizant of that. And I think um, choosing the right people, and I think the selection process, whether it be SEAL selection process or any selection process, but the SEAL one is the one I'm most familiar with, I think they've done a great job and they continue to do great work in trying to codify and understand what are those attributes you're looking for. And 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 bloodlust <laughs> certainly would not be one of them, right? So that's really funny. I can I'm all I'm I can already tell which ones have been beneficial to me as a sort of media entrepreneur author. Um, definitely grit, uh, you know, and we can sort of break these apart, which I, I love that you do in the book. I mean, it's so cool the way that you've organized this, but courage, perseverance, adaptability, resilience. Um, 
I mean, these are all so important, especially today, especially in the year 2020. You know, if, if there's anything that 2020 has proven us is that shit can go sideways real quick. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And you, you need to have some degree of grit. Yeah, you do. You know, grit's, grit is inherently human. And, and one of the things that was interesting for me in studying grit was that, it, you know, a lot of people think of grit as an attribute. Um, and it's really not. It's not just one thing. It's a, it's a combination of things. And, you know, Angela Duckworth did a book on grit, which is a really good book. And she said kind of the same thing. It's a, it's a combination of different things that make up grit. I certainly took, took the optic from, okay, what are the attributes that make up grit? And tried to simplify and make it pretty elemental. But, um, but courage, I mean, courage is, you know, so courage is interesting. It was a fascinating one for me, courage, because, you know, that's you know, our mutual friend, Andrew Huberman, and I worked on this a lot together um, because he studies it in the lab and I kind of experienced it in the field, mm. <laughs> right? Um, but the idea of what courage is, is that it is basically the ability to move into fear. Well, okay, what does that mean? Well, now we have to understand what fear is. Well, fear is, is, is actually interesting. Fear is actually the combination of two things. It's a combination of uncertainty plus anxiety, right? If you think about these two things in their singular uh, versions, right, you can have anxiety without uncertainty. That's, you know, I don't know, I'm nervous to do this podcast, <laughs> right? But I'm not uncertain about it, right? I'm just, you know, have some anxious or I'm nervous to give a presentation at work. That's anxiety without uncertainty. Uncertainty without anxiety, well, that's every kid on Christmas Eve, right? Mm -hmm. You combine the two and you, you begin to get, get fear, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have both anxiety and uncertainty, that's when fear starts to emerge. Fear is, in, my, in many ways, a kind of an elemental uh, unconscious response. It's your autonomic nervous system starting to ramp up, in some cases taking over, right? But you're certainly starting to teeter into the fight or flight response. Now, the freeze response is in there too, but really scientifically what they've seen is the freeze response is really just a rapid oscillation between fight or you're kind of trying to decide yeah. <laughs> between both, right? Whether to fight or flight. Whether, whether to fight or flight. So what's interesting about the, the neuroscience around this is that they've discovered circuits that actually uh, switch on with each of those responses. So if you, if you, if you fight, a certain circuit switches. If you flight, if you, uh, you know, you flee, a certain circuit turns on. That circuit that turns on when you fight, and by fight, you mean, we mean move into fear. It's not put up your dukes, right? Um, when you fight and that circuit goes, that's the courage switch. That's the courage circuit. You are switching on the courage circuit. And you're moving into your fear. Once you do that, you actually get a hit of, hit of dopamine. You get rewarded because from an evolutionary perspective, we had to do this. Humans had to be encouraged to move out, to move on, to, to, to explore, to discover, find berries, find food, whatever. So we needed a system in our in our physiology that encouraged us to do this. So that's our that's dopamine, right? So so when we when we decide to move into our fear, we get a dopamine response. We are all uh, predisposed with kind of a certain level at which we our our fear begins to set in, our autonomic response begins to kick in. If most of us are at like boiling point, like two twelve, right? We all know people who get afraid a lot faster, right? Maybe their boiling point is like 190, <laughs> right? So they, they get afraid fast. There are other people who get afraid. It takes them a while, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe at 230, this is like the Alex Honnold <laughs> free solo, right? Where it takes a while to kick on that switch. Um, but the, the idea is once it kicks on, so that, that, would, that would indicate our level of courage as an attribute. The good news is we can decide to move into it. And when we move in, we get rewarded. Um, the key thing about courage is that it cannot exist in the absence of fear. Fear has to be part of it. So, you know, me, who's, you know, and I talk about in the book, being afraid of heights, I don't like heights, you know, and so skydiving was always a challenge for me, you know, but every time I moved into that, you know, I'd get rewarded and encouraged me to, to do it. So we can actually work on that um, and move through and, and and train ourselves to move through fear. The, the I would maintain, I don't want to speak, uh, uh, you know, exclusively here or for, for the group, but I would maintain that one of the um, most powerful qualities of Navy SEALs or spec operators or even military folks is that not that they're fearless, it's that, we, it's that we've all designed our systems, we've practiced moving into fear habitually. We understand how to do it, and when we have to do it, we do it. And that's really the power behind a lot of people of service, whether it's a firefighter, a police officer, a, a, a surgeon or a nurse who was, who's, you know, fighting the, the COVID battle. I mean, these are people who are consistently moving into fear, mm. you know, and that's both admirable, but also for me, fascinating, <laughs> you know? And so, so they're all, so a lot of us had to actually work on our courage during 2020, but, um, but as an attribute, as a grid attribute, it's kind of the first, it's the first um, step, I think, in grit and the ability to, to kind of move into 
stress, anxiety challenge. I love that. I mean, few people listening to this are faced with physical danger, you know, mm-hmm. on a, on a day to day basis, the way that you and your, and your teammates are, but is this, is this essentially like a biological imperative to, to basically lean into parts of our life that, that, in, that, that evoke fear? Yeah. Fear and stress, right? I mean, fear it, and I stress. mean stress by design causes us to take action when we're hungry our body starts feeling stressed, right? So it's, it's, it's after, that's our body saying, go get food. When we're lonely, our body feels stressed. That's our body saying, go find, you know, companionship, right? So, so we've been designed naturally to move into, well, we've been designed naturally for stress to cause us to move, right? And then we've also been designed so that when stress turns into fear, we're rewarded when we keep moving. Mm. Now, again, it's not the reward when we necessarily get to the objective. It's taking every step, right? Every step we move, we get a reward. So we don't have to wait until we find the find the food at the other side of the mountain or whatever, or or find the mate, right? Every step towards that. If you, the 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 lonely guy who goes and talks to the girl in the supermarket who he finds attractive, he's going to get rewarded, you know, at least from dopamine. He may not, he may not get rewarded by a phone number, but right, you know, but story, that's, story of my life. Yeah, but doing that, you know, doing the action is 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 a positive step, and it's evolutionary. It's designed by evolution. You know? I love that. My um my mother growing up uh, always applauded uh, courage in my house, yeah. whether it was you know taking a test or going in for a medical procedure or getting a dental filling or something like that. She always uh, she always identified when you know either me or my two younger brothers were exhibiting courage, and she would praise us yeah. for that. Yeah, and um. And I definitely credit her. I mean, you know, regular listeners of of my podcast, you know, people who know my work know that, you know, much of my work has been not just motivated by her, but it's been sort of just a constant practice of like, you know, moving into areas where, um, where, you know, it's, it's sort of been uncomfortable for me and I've just sort of like went in that direction. Yeah. And it's uncertain, right? I mean, uncertainty typically is going to come with anxiety. Human beings don't like uncertainty. You know, again, Christmas... Christmas Eve is just one example where where it doesn't you know anxiety might not be be additive to that, um, but you know typically when you're moving into uncertainty there's there's anxiety with that and so so yeah if we have if we set up a an environment where we're 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 adding to the rewards of moving in one of the best pieces of advice and I I named it it was it, be, it became the name of the first chapter of the courage chapter uh, one of the best pieces of advice a senior officer once told me was to beware the fearless leader because mm. he'll likely get you killed. Right, because wow. if you have a leader who shows no fear, then that person is not effectively managing risk. <laughs> you know, because fear is designed to make us stop, make us think, make us contemplate, and decide to either move into it or flee. Sometimes flee is the right answer. You know, don't get me wrong. Sometimes it is. You know, we're not supposed to fight a bear, but um, uh, but yeah, that's you have to. You know, anybody who's who. Well, I would maintain anybody who purports to be fearless is lying. Um, but if you actually see that type of behavior. I, I, I'd probably keep a distance. <laughs> there was that amazing scene in one of my favorite movies of all time, The Dark Knight Rises. Oh, I'm a huge yes. fan of the Dark Knight trilogy. It's yeah. like one of my favorite, I mean, I just like obsessed. And uh, when when Bruce Wayne is stuck in the pit in wherever on earth that, that pit happens to be, you know, Bane puts him there after he breaks his back. He, the the, the prisoner who he's um, imprisoned with, his, his prison mate, mm-hmm. um, is asking him like, you know, when he's going to take the leap, when he's going to like try to try to get out of, the, out of the thing. And Bruce Wayne keeps saying that he's like not afraid of death. He has no fear of death. And the, his prison mate says, well, that's your problem. Right. You know, you have to fear death and then yeah. you have to harness that fear. Yeah. Yeah. So the best music. So by the way, I listened to that specific soundtrack uh, that it's, it's that part. So it's I think it's called The Climb or Why, yeah, do, we, cl- why yeah. do We Fall is the, yes. the music, right? It's beautiful because it's like, yeah. yeah, it's just it's it's a that's exactly it. You need, you know, we are designed to fight faster, to move stronger, to to survive if we have fear. If you have no fear, you know, that's dangerous. So Yeah, you need fear. Yeah. I love the um the mental acuity section. Um can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes. Um so mental acuity was probably the one that I um focused on the most when I was running the SEAL training piece hmm. because Again, we were dealing with guys who were very experienced, and we were putting them through um, training scenarios. And, and one particular one is close quarter combat, which is really the the act of clearing a room or building. So you run into a building, you have to clear it. You know, either you're finding someone you have to you know grab or save. Uh, but I, the the idea is you have to go room by room. Uh, police officers do that when they have to go and and 
take down a house or find find a bad guy. Um, but that's um, the sequence of close quarter combats or CQVC is actually very dynamic and very um, uh, unpredictable. In other words, it's constantly changing. Right? The, the, you, no 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 run. There's a kind of no run is ever the same. And it's all a matter of you as the as an individual adjusting rapidly to your teammates in a very dynamic and in 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 the case of live fire could be deadly, you know, scenario or, or environment. Um, and so mental acuity attributes became really uh, something I focused on because it really it's really about how the brain works and how the brain po- processes our environment. So it's four of them. It starts with situational awareness. So how how aware are we of everything that's coming in? So we get eleven million bits of information a second. A all, second, yeah, through all of our senses, right? Um, and that's all five, I guess six if we <laughs> if we want to get a little bit more um, into it. Um, <laughs> but uh, but our 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 logical, you know, our frontal lobe really only processes uh, I think twenty five hundred or three thousand of that, right? So hmm. so the, so there's a lot happening that we're not noticing. Well, excuse me, we're 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 noticing our, our senses are noticing, but we're not putting attention to it. Like you know, we can say that you know, right now you're not noticing the bottom of your feet in your shoes, right? Until I just told you, now right? You're noticing it, right? Now so, I am. But that, but for a while there, we weren't, right? So, so situation awareness is your ability to take in that information and actively say, process it in the way that's okay. I noticed this. I noticed that. Um, in a word, it's kind of vigilance. So, so higher vigilant people or hyper vigilant people will notice a lot of things. You know, I'm I've, I've I was always this way, but I've certainly hyper developed this in my career right i'm the, i'm the type of person who when i walk down a street in new york city i'm noticing people i'm noticing their hands i'm noticing dark alleys i'm noticing doorways i'm noticing traffic coming coming at me right i'm noticing a lot of things you can be overly vigilant you know that's too much that that becomes stressful right but situational awareness in in short is your ability to take in information once you take in that information you now have to compartmentalize it to effectively operate and that's based on okay what is my objective at this moment and what um, what in this mass of incoming information can I use to effectively achieve my objective? So this would be, I kind of use this example in the book, but this would be I'm at an airport and I'm late for my flight, okay? And I'm running through the, through the gates, right? There's a lot of information around me, right? I can see the chilies, I can see the bathrooms, I can see the, uh, the, the board, you know, I can see the gate numbers. Out of everything that's, that I can see, everything I'm taking in, I can, I can hear the, the announcement, right? Everything I'm taking in, what do I need to focus on right now? Well, I need to focus on finding my gate, right? So compartmentalization is immediately taking it in, assessing it, prioritizing it. Okay, out of everything I'm just noticing, I don't need to know about the chilies. I don't need to know about the bathrooms. I don't need to know about the 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 the, the, the flight board because that's I have to find my way in there anyway. What I'm going to focus on is the the, the gate signs, right? Mm-hmm. So assessing, prioritizing. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on the gate signs and then focusing. Now I'm gonna focus on this and 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 move towards. Uh, that is compartmentalization. Now that's kind of buttressed and um, um, and assisted by task switching, which is kind of the next phase. Task switching is our ability to come out of one focus and into another. Um, so this happens all the time naturally, right? You know, if you're driving a car and you park it and you um, so let me let me back up. Inside of certain contexts, there's task switching. So while we're driving a car, we're task switching, right? I'm focusing on the road at one point. I'm pushing the brake. I might be playing with the radio. Hopefully, I'm not on my phone, right? Hopefully, <laughs> I'm putting my blinker on. That, that you're task switching within a context. Um, then you have t- uh, task switching outside context, right? I park the car. I'm walking into the supermarket, right? Well, now I'm task switched into. A, I'm walking in a parking lot, which takes another set of vigilance, right? Another set of prioritization because I got to look at parked cars or or moving cars. Then I move into the supermarket, and now it switches again, right? So that's task switching. So our ability to task switch effectively speaks to our level of task switching as an attribute. We, of course, all have it. Some of us are better at it, and some of us are not so good at it. Some people, you know, you might be someone who, when you get focused into something, it's very hard for you to switch your attention, really hard to come out and switch. Yeah. Um, other people switch too fast, right? Hmm. Uh, this might be the, I mean, attention to deficit could be like the far end of this, where it's like constant switching. You know, you can't focus on anything, right? So, so t- task switching is something we all do. Your, your ability to do it efficiently, effectively speaks to your level of task switching. And then, of course, learnability is the last one because you have to be able to process and learn all these things. So, so, so if you have lots of, if you have a high level of learnability, then you're processing things that are coming in. You're not making the same mistakes. You're learning, okay, last time I did that, it went into my hippocampus. Now I remember it, right? And, 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 and I won't do the same thing again. So 
So when we're in dynamic environments, our ability to kind of move through those cycles efficiently, effectively start speaking to each of these uh, attributes. That part, that section of the book is probably the only section where the attributes are very, very, are very much um, synergized and and in, intertwined, right? You know, in other words, you can talk about courage in in grit, and you can talk about discipline in drive. When you when you're in the in the act of being driven, right? Courage actually, it, it, you can you can you can use some courage, right? So so those can be kind of segmented, but the mental acuity attributes actually all relate and they're intertwined because it's all about how your brain processes the world. There's like overlap. Overlap. You said earlier that um, one way to to uh, boost your efficacy in each of these attributes is to kind of lean into the air, you know, the attributes where you may not be as as effective. Right. Um, so would you say that something like situational awareness, like how would you improve if you're not the most situationally aware person. Yeah, first thing I would recommend is take off the headphones and put away the iPhone, <laughs> mm. <laughs> right? And pay attention to your environment, right? First of all, it's beautiful, usually. I mean, because that the world is. Um, I do this as someone who's vigilant. I put myself, I love walking in New York City. Well, of course, I'm waiting for New York City to get back where it was, right? But <laughs> pre-COVID, when we had a bunch of people walking around the subways, I love the subway system. And it's because it exercises all these mental acuity attributes for me. Mm. Because it's highly dynamic. There's a lot going on. I have to process information, I have to prioritize, I have to act, and it's thoroughly confusing, you know. So I would say as an individual who wants to exercise them, just put yourself into environments that um, that allow you to um, to notice things. You know, it could be as simple as, hey, next time you're running in the woods, don't listen to music. Don't, you know, don't turn on your stopwatch. Just notice, you know, no, you know, take, take time to notice, be present. You know, meditation, there are meditation practices all about this, right? Be present in your moment, right? Um, when it comes to compartmentalization, you can you can start thinking about okay, what is it that I want? To, what is my objective in this moment? Okay, based on that objective, if it might not be as as kind of drastic as you know, I got to find my gate because I'm late for my flight, but it might be hey, I want to I want to find the lo local library, <laughs> whatever that is. Okay, as I'm driving, what are the things I need to notice to help me with that objective and prioritize that way? Um, and then task switching um, is. It, it happens quite naturally. I think the best thing about uh, the best way to um, to effectively uh, manage your task, well, you can develop your task switching by doing it more effectively inside whatever context you're looking for. So, so it's effective when you're developing it. So I have an objective, so I'm going to task switch. So let me give you the airport example. I'm going to look for my gate. Um, as I'm focusing on those uh, those gate numbers, I'm also paying attention to the announcements, right? The announcement, and then I hear an announcement say, hey, flight, whatever. Is delayed. Well, now I can task switch, right? Because my I just heard my flight was delayed. I can say, okay, well now I'm going to focus on chilies because I'm hungry or want a beer or whatever. So mm -hmm. um, the problem with task switching is most of us task switch too much, and because it's because of these devices that we have in our pockets, right? Yeah. I mean, th these these um, these mobile phones are literally uh, um, contact. They're 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 boxes of different contexts, right? So when you go from having this conversation, you and I having a conversation to my phone texting and beeping me, and I make that switch, you know, that's like the cognitive, that's like cognitively leaping from a library to a soccer field. Right? <laughs> my brain has to do the work, and it's been proven that it takes a while to get fully into that next context, especially to leap back, right? Mm. So we're, we're actually forcing ourselves oftentimes to context switch when we actually shouldn't be. And by the way, that's exhausting. You know, our brains are, our brains only run on about 40 watts of power, right? So, um, so when we're, constantly asking it to task switch, you know, when, when it's really not necessary to, well, we're going to be exhausted. This is one of the reasons why these devices are kind of exhausting us, you know, but it's also why you can't, we're finding that the connection is not happening as well, because we're allowing ourselves to get, get ripped out of context when we shouldn't be, you know, uh, because we have a, a beep, even a beep, by the way, even, if, even if I heard my phone beep right now, and I decided not to, well, I'm, I'm talking to you. So I'm like, that's still a, it's a mental, it's a, it's, it's a mental leap, right? So, so see, even these alerts, people's like, well, I'll just, I'll just, I, I won't look at my phone. I'll just hear the alert. Well, the alert is a shift in context as well. There was, yeah, there was an inter there was a very interesting study that came out. I think I cite it, um, in, in my book, Genius Foods, uh, no, sorry, The Genius Life, uh, where they found, researchers found that just having a smartphone like on the table next to you exerts sort of a, <laughs> I love the way they put it in the study. I just, I remember it because I thought it was so beautifully put. It exerts a gravitational pull yeah. on one's attention. Yes. Well, just, it, just having the phone in your proximity. Yeah. Well, and worse yet, I, so if, if you and I are talking, if so if we started this, this conversation and right beforehand I put my phone on the table, 
who would you think my priority is? What would you think my priority is? Well, it's probably not a hundred percent me. It's, it's probably it's like probably not the hundred percent. Yes, yeah. exactly right. So, so you are in effect by leaving your phone, even if you're having a, a dinner with someone, by putting your phone in a visible way, you're actually sending a message, and the message is you're not as important as well. I would just say you're not the only thing that's important right now, right? Yeah. That's a, that's a, actually a per, pretty powerful subconscious message versus I'm going to put this away, right? And this is it. I'm going to focus on you right now. So so it it's it it can inhibit human relationship too just by putting a phone on a table in front of you because it's just not showing. It's not sending the right uh, subconscious message. I love that. I'm I'm loving talking to you. I, so one of the so like I guess you know a, a question that has arisen over the past um, you know 40 minutes or so is the goal for people reading this to basically improve their attributes across the board, across all 25 of these attributes, or is it to find the attributes where they currently excel and to, and then to sort of orient their lives around those attributes? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's probably more even, it's more general than that. It's really to figure out where you stand and figure out what you want to do. Um, hmm. There, there is certainly a strength to understanding. So I'm, you know, I'm kind of, it's kind of this analogy is like to, if you want to, if you want to tweak your engine, the engine of your car, you want to put a bunch of sexy stuff on it. The first thing you better do is probably learn the engine, right? Because if you start stacking things on this engine without knowing the engine, things are going it's, to, it's, things are going to probably start blowing up or, or whatever, right? I think it's the same thing with us as humans. And we have so much out there right now that purports to make you better if you do this thing or do that thing or stack this or try this technique. And there's nothing wrong with any of them. I think, I think a lot of them actually have a lot of efficacy. Um, but if we don't know ourselves first, then how do we know what to stack, <laughs> right? Maybe nitrous oxide is not what my engine needs right now, right? So, so I think the, I, my goal for the book is someone to read it and first understand themselves. What does their own unique palette look like? And then from that point, say, okay, based on what I'd like to do or what I'm doing, what are those attributes that I would like to develop or I have enough of, or I'd not like to, I don't think you need to mute attributes, but maybe you do. Maybe narcissism needs to be muted. Um, what do I need to do to maximize my performance? And I think that's the goal. Um, one of the things that we're offering on the website is a free assessment tool. So you go to the website, you can take a, an assessment for your grid attributes, your drive attributes, and your mental acuity attributes to see where you stand on these things. And it's based on a collection of data of about a thousand people over, you know, around the world, really. So, so based on grit, okay, where do I compare to a thousand people? So what the, it's, it's designed to give the user a snapshot of where they might sit and then ask them and then read the book and then say, okay, where do I actually sit on this based on my assessment, based on the book? Okay, what do I want to, to improve? And if I say, you know what, maybe I do need a little bit more empathy. Okay, how do I develop empathy, right? And I'm also I put, put stuff on the site to help people develop that too, if you want to develop each attribute. What's um, the website? The website is theattributes.com. Theattributes.com. Yeah, pretty simple. That's awesome. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a little bit of both. It's really, there's no, you know, I'm really fascinated with human potential and human potential is what could be, right? But to, to, to reach what could be, we have to understand where we sit first because what my could be is, is different than what your could be is, right? So, um, so I think it's really important for people to understand where they sit, you know, introspective, um, kind of self-analysis. Where do I sit? How do I show up to the game? What do I have? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? Okay. With that, how do I then, you know, start marching towards my potential. You mentioned that narcissism is an attribute, yeah. which, uh, which is interesting because I tend to think about, you know, narcissism as usually being, being not a good thing. I've just been told <laughs> that Max, you're too narcissistic, you know, and I yeah. usually get smacked on the hand for it. Um, proverbially. So how is that, how is narcissism a, a good thing well, or, it's certainly, or an attribute worth cultivating? Yeah, it's certainly a pejorative word. Um, it's so I wanted to explore cause I was trying to figure out what drives people and narcissism is certainly a word that's we've we've heard a lot of these last you know you know several years um and i think that it was one of these things that i said you know what i kind of had to think back to my own experience and and i can't i can't speak for every seal <laughs> but i will speak for many uh when i say to you this that most seals we become seals not necessarily because we're patriotic or for love of country okay we we are patriotic we all we love our country but most of us become SEALs because we want to be badasses, right? We want to do something that very few people do. We want to see if we have what it takes, right? Um, there's narcissism behind that. There's this mm. ability, there's this desire to stand out, to be recognized, to be special. Um, 
we, this is biological, by the way, when we are infants and we're being paid attention to by our parents, okay, we are getting bursts of serotonin, dopamine, and oxytocin. Okay, those are three very powerful chemicals. Dopamine and serotonin being neurotransmitters are kind of immediate, oxytocin being the, the more longer term uh, hormone. Um, so when we get a pay, paid attention to it, it feels good, right? So, so it feels good to stand out. You said all of us want to do that somehow, so in, in some way. We all want to feel special to someone. We want to be paid attention to in some ways, right? So narcissism is, I want to kind of humanize it to say, hey, it's okay to be narcissistic. It's okay to, it's okay to want to stand out. I mean, listen, some of our greatest performers or scientists or whomever, they, they, they went down those roads because they wanted to do, they wanted to be different. They wanted to be special. They wanted to stand out. Nothing wrong with that. It becomes wrong when it gets overboard, right? So, so narcissistic personality disorder is a codified <laughs> disorder, right? It in the DSM five, there's nine categories of 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 of, um, of uh, qualities that you exhibit. That if you have, I think they say if you have any one of them, <laughs> right, <laughs> um, you have the you have the disorder. Well, if you read those nine, you're like, okay, I don't have that, but <laughs> I ha I've felt elements of that, you know. So, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? So, I think narcissism was one thing we had to kind of that I was really interested in saying, okay, how does it affect drive? How does it drive people? And if we are able to effectively recognize it in ourselves and say, okay, I want to be special. I want to stand out. Um, I'm going to use this to my advantage, but make sure that I don't get overboard. That there, there therein lies the, the problem, right? Because narcissism is like a vampire staring in the mirror, right? It's very difficult, if not impossible, to see in ourselves. So we have to be very careful about it and the way we inoculate ourselves against narcissism is through our trusted, loving relationships. Those people who we know we love and they love us and they tell us the truth and they tell us when we're getting out over our skis and they say, hey, your head's getting too big, you know, stop it, <laughs> right? Those are the people who keep us in check. My wife has done this for me for 20 years, right? She is my grounding wire, <laughs> right? And she always will be and my kids are the same way. So we always, it's always funny, you know, when the, the house, you know, I think it, Barack Obama said recently he was being asked about, you know, being the president and how he, you know, how he, uh, you know, how he's viewed in his household. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm, you're never the prophet in your own land. right? <laughs> and, and that's such a good thing to say, because if that's the case, then you have a great land because that means you're being grounded. All right. And, and, and to establish relationships around you of people who love you and trust you enough and care for you enough to keep you in check is the key. True narcissists who with with the actual disorder will surround themselves with sycophants, right? Mm. And if someone if someone ceases to be a sycoph sycophant, they're ejected from the group. Usually they usually they self-eject as they get sick of it themselves. And as soon as they do, they're they're demonized, right? As soon as you leave that group, the, the narcissist demonizes that person, right? So uh, so you can tell narcissists, um, you can start seeing well, it's usually pretty easy to see <laughs> on the outside, right? Um, but if you are if you are um in a circle, um, and you can kind of see this honestly, and it's a bunch of people who only agree with you, only you're kind of always the center of tension, you know, you're, you're never wrong, right? You may want to check yourself, right? Because, because it's those deep relationships that really are the, are the inoculation. But I know so many people like that. <laughs> Maybe not so many, but I definitely I've, I've come across one or two, uh, in my time living in, in LA. And, uh, in working in sort of the media business and yeah, they're not, they're not fun to be around if you're not a sycophant. It's true. It's true. Yeah. And that's, and that's why they're, that's why those groups are typically, um, uh, they're not, they're, they're very short term, right? Mm. They're, they're constantly swapping out people, you know? And I would say, you know, there's another, that was another beauty of, I think being in the SEAL teams is you were surrounded by people who really took themselves and each other very seriously enough that we wanted everybody, we want all of us to perform uh, because at the end of the day, it's, it's not only your life, but, but your buddies. Um, and the environment, if you, if you, if you're consistently putting yourself into environments that humble you, so you're not going to find a lot of big wave surfers, for example, who are not humble <laughs> because the ocean is the most humbling environment on the planet. Right. Um, but, you know, so, so environmentally you can do this too, you know, and the environment humbles you as well. Um, and so I think finding ways to be humble, to understand you, you are, you're good, you know, but it's the difference between confidence and arrogance, right? I mean, confidence, Hey, I can do this. I know I can. Um, arrogance is, you know, I'm better than, than other people and yeah. I got nothing to learn. 
right? Yeah. And that's not the that's not the case. I'm so glad that uh, being a narcissist is not is not an inherently or being nar being being somewhat narcissist having having somewhat. I'm just like burying myself in a in a ditch here, but like <laughs> having somewhat narcissistic attributes is not an inherently bad thing. It's when it's out of balance with other sort of you know personality traits. That's right. When it becomes problematic. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Some of our greatest iconoclasts were had narcissistic tendencies, and and we have them to thank for some of the. Greatest inventions and uh, explore, uh, discoveries um, we, on the planet. I love that. I feel so much better about myself. <laughs> um, thank you for that, Rich. Uh, so we don't have that much time left, but um, I just want to touch on the um, umbrella category into which narcissism fits, and that's drive, because I think that drive is something that many people, you know, kind of struggle with, especially today when, yeah. um, you know, when 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 there is so much uncertainty, as you described. So what can we expect uh, by diving into that section of the book? Well, there are five attributes that make it up. First is self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is kind of a combination of a couple of things. It's not just this, I got this, or I could, you know, you know, just do it type thing. It's this mentality that I, uh, it's a combination between confidence, initiative, and uh, optimism, right? And you have all three of those. Each one of those by itself is inert, right? Confidence on its own doesn't do much, right? I'm confident I could fly a plane. Because my dad was a pilot, my brother's a pilot. I, I grew up loving flying. I'm confident I could do it, but I've never flown a plane, right? So confidence on its own doesn't work. Um, initiative, again, you need the ability to take that first step, you know. And initiative on its own, without being buttressed by something else, especially optimism or or uh, realism, um, could be dangerous, right? You can put a you know, you know six year old in the driver's seat of a car. He's going to have the initiative. He or she's going to have the initiative to step on that accelerator, right? But without purpose, it's dangerous, right? Um, and then optimism, optimism tempered with realism, but not to the extent that, we're, that it becomes pessimism, right? So I know I can do this, right? I have the initiative to start, and then I know along the way I will figure it out, right? So it's kind of that long-term self-efficacy. So that's number one. Discipline is number two. And discipline I found fascinating because I had to separate discipline with self-discipline um, uh, because they're two different things, as I discovered. And I did this through self-analysis, <laughs> really, because... Um, I am highly unself-disciplined as a human being. I just find it very difficult, <laughs> you know. And and what I realized was self-discipline is largely internally focused. You know, I can eat right, I can work out right. There's there's nothing about the external world. The external world doesn't have a lot of say in one's self-discipline, right? Um, discipline, however, and the kind I talk about in the book is the ability to see and achieve long-term objectives, right? Of which the external world has a part, right? I want to get that big promotion. I want to write that book. I want to become a Navy SEAL. I want to become a successful podcaster. The external world has a say in that, right? And so discipline holistically um, involves the ability to move through uh, that, uh, that process, you know, and move through the highs and the lows and be able to get to your objective. Self-discipline, the, the highly self-disciplined person is such usually because that person loves structure and, and, and structure is certainty, right? So sometimes being too self-disciplined can actually affect your overall discipline, right? Mm. Because like you said, to be able to get where you are today, you had to march into uncertainty. Well, uncertainty is by definition uncertain, right? Which means you would you likely had to break structure quite a bit just to just to navigate that space, right? So so the best, the most successful people are the people who are both self-disciplined and disciplined, right? They know how to balance those things. But I separated it because I thought it was important. There are very, very highly successful people, people who are very disciplined in their achievements that as you know very unself-disciplined right you know, they didn't have a lot of self-discipline so i separated that um the next one is um uh, open-mindedness which really is very self-explanatory i mean the, the closed mind is a certain mind and to uh to uh to be certain about that which you'd understand is to court disaster <laughs> mm. i would say right you have to you have to be able to to look at things from a different um optic um Cunning is one that again can be pejorative, but it's this is this is really in short the ability to think outside the box, right? We are all uh, guilty of when we're when we're faced with problems a a bias that comes with that problems. Oftentimes those biases are given to us in the form of rules or conditions, right? And in fact, a problem that needs to be solved has it has two criteria: it has a solution, it, it requires a solution or objective, and it has conditions or variables, right? The cunning mind starts to take those variables and conditions and, and asks, okay, are those actually real or perceived, and can I break them, right? Um, and if you can break them, that's what the cunning mind does, right? So, so it, cunning is, again, one of the primary qualities of successful Navy SEALs is cunning, the ability to think outside the box to break rules, right? Because, because again, in, in back in the days of Draper Coffin, these 
guys who are swimming across the beach, you know, sometimes they'd have to swim across the beach to frustrate enemy, frustrate or sabotage enemy lines. Well, these are, you know, five man groups with pistols and, and swim fins, right? I mean, hmm. these, if they get ca caught, they are dead, you know, <laughs> captured at the best, right? So they had to be cunning in the way that they, that they attacked the enemy. They were, they were uh, surgical in their, um, in their objective versus, you know, kind of in mass, right? So cunning is a, is a huge thing. And I think cunning is a, is a really effective attribute when it comes to drive because it allows you to think about problems that come come your way in different ways, you know. Um, and so that's that's why I talk about cunning. And then finally, narcissism. Narcissism we talked about, but this idea that uh, that hey, I, I you know my my desire to stand out and be paid attention to matters, and it's driving me. And that's there's not that's just the truth, <laughs> you know. It is. I mean, ask anybody who's made it big and. Part of that desire was to stand out. I love it. What are some things that uh, readers gain when they learn about the 25 different attributes and then work in their own lives to improve on them? Uh, they, will, they will gain an understanding about themselves and their performance. Uh, they will, I think they will be able to index the things they learned in this book about how they managed through 2020. And by doing that, how they can excel in 2021 because they learned a lot. And I guarantee there were some of the attributes that they didn't have a lot of that they developed the heck out of in 2020. It just made them do it. The environment made them do it so they can learn about what they developed. Um, so gain an understanding of themselves, uh, uh, dissect what is required to, to achieve their next goal or, or their objective. That's the kind of the individual. As teams, it allows a team to understand, okay, what am I, what, what is this team, what is this team's capability in terms of their, their, their collection of attributes and what are our gaps? I mean, what are we missing? Because the best teams are, are teams that are collection are kind of a mesh between attributes, right? I talk about I talk about others in the book. There's three other attributes that I talk about because I talk about them because either polarity is good, right? So there's competitiveness or non-competitiveness. Both are actually good. If you have a, a, a competitive person and a non-competitive person on a team, you're you're in great shape, right? Mm. Because because a competitive person is very good when it comes to understanding the rules of the game, right? And they can look at an environment and immediately start to say, okay, these are the rules and here's how to win. Mm. Not only win, but crush it, right? The non-competitive person, again, I've never been competitive either. I've always been non-competitive. I've always looked at the pack and be like, what are those people? What else is going on? I don't want to be part of that pack. Right? Hmm. The non-competitive person will see avenues outside the pack, right? And so to have both polarities on a team is actually powerful. So, so to understand the attributes from a, respect to a team or business, I think, can be very effective. Um, and then just, you know, you know, ask yourself, where can I go from here? I think that's the, you know, again, understand your own engine and your team's engine, I think, is, is the goal. It's brilliant. I mean, it, it really does give you, you know, when I saw the book, I knew immediately that I want that I wanted to have you on the podcast to talk about it, because I feel like it's going to give people a new vocabulary with which to understand um, themselves and their own capabilities in the world. It's sort of like, you know, when I opened up your book and I looked at your at the table of contents, it's kind of how I felt when I read uh, recently the five love languages, which is a totally <laughs> different topic, but it's a it's a vocabulary with which to understand like relating to one another and yeah. and expressing and receiving love. You know, so this is obviously a different topic, but it's similar in that it gives you a new kind of like framework. And then once you have these insights, you know, gleaned from the book, you carry them with you for the rest of your life. So. Yeah. It's a really wonderful work, man. Congrats on on writing it. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's uh, been a pleasure to be here and meet you. So yeah, yeah. same. Um, I've got one last question for you, but before we get to that, where can listeners find you on social media, and where and when can they grab your book? Yeah, January twenty sixth is the release date. Um, uh, Theattributes.com. Pretty much everything's there to include links to uh, my Instagram, uh, my LinkedIn page, and the Facebook page. So there's the attributes LinkedIn, Facebook, and. Um, and Instagram, and I also have my personal Instagram, so we can find everything there. And uh, be happy to have you uh, or anyone subscribe and get some newsletters and get you know any cool stuff that we have coming down the pike. Dope. The attributes: twenty five hidden drivers of optimal performance. So cool. Well, Rich Davini, thanks uh, for being here. The last question that gets asked everybody on the show: What does it mean to you to live a genius life? Uh, to live a genius life is to know oneself to the extent that one can continually explore one's potential. Um, and, and really for me, it's been about, okay, what is my edge? All right, I'm gonna move to that edge and, and step over it and then look for the next edge. And, um, and to me, that's growth, that's longevity, that's youth. Um, that is what I intend on doing until the day I, you know, until the day I pass, right? Um, and uh, and it's, it's, 
inherently means stepping outside your comfort zone, you know, uh, whatever that is. Um, we should not fear it. We should embrace it because that's how we learn. That's how we grow. Yeah. No fear or have fear. Just step into that. <laughs> step into the fear. Step into that bad boy. Right. <laughs> You're the man. Thanks for being here. To all you guys out there in podcast land, text me to let me know what you thought about this episode of the show. You can do that by hitting up 310-299-9401. Pick up the attributes. Also, we've got new merch at thegeniuslife.com. We've got socks. You can wear socks with my face on the ankles. We've got fanny packs. We've got hoodies. We've got t-shirts, all kinds of stuff. Check that out. And I will catch you on the next episode. Peace, guys.